Now, uh, we ended the program last night discussing what little information there was about the massive spill of poison into the water supply of about 300,000 human beings in West Virginia. We will get to more details in the course of conversation. In particular, I have asked um, a person for whom I have a great deal of respect, a man by the name of Ed Rabel, who you may recall, if you are of a certain age, as an Emmy Award winning journalist uh, with CBS um, back in the day. More importantly, however, Ed is now a candidate for the second district seat in the Congress of the United States being vacated by Shelley Moore Capito because of her overarching ambition to run for the Senate seat of uh, being vacated by Senator John D. Rockefeller IV, otherwise known as Jay. Ed Rabel is running as a Mountain Party candidate. That means he is uh, more than likely to be uh, much more in line with the thinking of the, uh, of the Horn family and of progressives and otherwise decent human beings out there all over the place. I do believe I have Ed on the line. Uh, let's bring him along. Bob, how are you? This is Ed Rabel. And uh, by the way, uh, I'm running as an independent, and I welcome the support of the Mountain Party. I'm, I apologize for that, Ed, but uh, uh, I, I guess I just sort of naturally associated you. But uh, independent it shall be, and that's doesn't change the fact that were I in the second district, I would be a committed voter for you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We've had a bad uh, uh, event here in um, our region, and it's not just uh, Charleston, but also uh, surrounding counties, about nine counties, and as you said, about 300,000 people have been uh, affected. And so uh, this is something that um, we really uh, obviously deplore, and uh, and we don't know where it's going to end, Bob. No, we don't. Uh, the, the, the list of what we don't know, Ed, is far more extensive than that list of what we do know. Among other things, we don't know much about the chemical except for the fact that mm, it can make you awfully, awfully sick. Uh, we, don't e we don't even know how long people, and this is probably the most horrifying part of it all, we don't know how long people were consuming poisoned water before the warnings went out, do we? Well, that's exactly right. And here's what happened. Uh, you know, this uh, a privately held company called Freedom Industries, uh, which uh, operates the chemical storage tanks and production facilities right along the Elk River that flows into the Canal River, uh, they didn't even let the government know that there had been a spill that uh, thousands and thousands of gallons of this chemical called MCHM, hard for me to pronounce, it's called methocyclohexane methanol. Very good. <laughs> Better than I can do. Yeah, it's, a, it's a compound that used to wash uh, coal of impurities, and uh, obviously it it's, uh, poses significant dangers to humans, when they're in close contact with this. And what happened is uh, this uh, chemical started leaking out yesterday and was leaking for a long time into the water supply. Uh, and it wasn't the company that alerted the government, but people who uh, began uh, uh, smelling the odor of this stuff, which smells kind of like licor licorice, and they are the ones who alerted the government. So. All the way from the beginning, it appears that uh, there's been a dereliction of duty and responsibility by this company. Well, it, it, cer it certainly does look that way, but the, the problems extend far beyond the company, do they not, Ed? Um, with, there, are, there are issues related to, for instance, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, who later said, or, or said sometime during the day, that no, none of their air monitors, and they have air monitors that WVDEP does, because the Kanawha Valley is chock-a-block with lots of chemical plants that could kill you in lots of different ways. Uh, but none of their air monitors would have found this stuff. Yeah, and, you know, one of the problems here is this, that uh, most of the coverage down here of what has been going on uh, has been 
uh, focused on uh, whether the first response broke down, uh, whether the alerts uh, weren't clear. But, you know, uh, they're focusing, the media are focusing on the wrong thing. What happens is uh, when they focus on that, uh, basically the people who are trying to uh, get away from uh, their responsibilities in, in terms of what happened, uh, they try to shift that over to government responsibility as opposed to the responsibility of the of the very company that uh, allowed this leak to happen. So uh, that's where we, you know, are, are in trouble here. Not only uh, has this uh, company apparently uh, violated all kinds of safety measures, but it also uh, is trying to shift blame over uh, to uh, the government and to uh, outfits like the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And I'll tell you this, if I'm elected, I promise as my first official act as congressman from the 2nd Congressional District, I'm going to seek a full congressional investigation of the effect of coal production on local water supplies nationwide. And uh, we, you know, we can't have this anymore in West Virginia. This is basically they're turning it into an industrial zone, and that's unfortunate. And the fact of the matter is, if one is um, uh, conversant at all, Ed, with the nature of West Virginia's history, one understands that this has been a sacrifice zone for in excess of 100 years. Uh, I tallied up the numbers, and I came up with something like 100,000 unnecessary deaths in the last 100 years or so. Uh, once you combine all the all the mine explosions, uh, all the all the root routine accidents, the black lung, the people who die in mountaintop removal communities simply because they live near mountaintop removal. Um, this, it, it, it has been, we've just been sort of casually sacrificed for a dollar for more than a century now. And I, I wonder, I, is, this, is this the wake-up call people have needed? And, and if, it, if it is, Ed, how does it differ from 1972's uh, Buffalo Creek disaster? Well, obviously, the Buffalo Creek disaster took uh, hundreds of lives, and in that sense, this is not, uh, uh, so far as we know, and, and we're still in the early stages of this uh, environmental disaster, but um, it, it says to us that uh, we just are rather casual about the lives of people in our region. When it, you know, uh, how is it that uh, you can allow... Uh, an outfit to locate along a main uh, tributary, a main stream, a main river, and put their tanks in there, and uh, and then uh, you know be subject to um, pollution like this. How can we uh, allow that to continue without some sort of uh, reflection on on where we're going, what we're doing? You know, Bob, when. Uh, Democratic and Republican politicians in West Virginia talk about coal. Uh, they talk about the industry. You know, when Shelley Moore Capito says that uh, coal means jobs and that there's a war on coal, uh, what she's talking about is the industry. So we need to talk about the miners and their families and their communities. And above all, uh, we need to do as uh, Senator uh, Byrd did back in 2009 when he said the time has come to have an open and honest dialogue about coal's future in West Virginia. So he said, let's speak the truth. And so let's speak a little truth here. Let me, if you'll indulge me just a minute. Absolutely. I'll, I'll tell you this. It, it's at least naive and at worst deceitful to suggest that if the EPA would go away, coal would boom again, and so would jobs. Almost all of the job losses in the coal industry are attributable to mechanization, increasing costs of extraction, widespread rejection of new coal-fired power plants by communities all over America, and by competition from low-priced natural gas and cheap western coal. And then there's this. Coal is no longer the engine that drives West Virginia's economy. Today, it provides less than 6% of incomes and less than 3% of jobs. What's more, the scourge of black lung disease is back and it's afflicting miners at higher rates than it did in the 1970s. And meanwhile, coal companies are still trying to evade responsibility. Now think about it. As the Patriot coal episode showed, if we don't help miners fight for their pensions, the companies will even try to take those away. So the industry costs the state more in expenses than it contributes in taxes. So in short, by 
granting tax favors to the coal industry and squandering vast amounts of political capital railing against the EPA and passing protectionist legislation, Democratic and Republican leaders are mortgaging West Virginia's e economic and environmental future in pursuit of a myth and ignoring the pressing need to plan for a post-coal economy. So uh, I'll get off my... Well, that's okay. I just have one question. Are you sure I can't convince you to run for Senate so I get to vote for you? <laughs> You're very kind. Well, uh, uh, I, I, say, I say that seriously because it's become a very frustrating event for me to go to the polls uh, anymore, Ed, because I go in and I wind up leaving more, more, more ballot positions blank than I, than I cast votes. Right. Uh, because there's, there's no one that, I'm, I, I see a trip to the, I see a trip to the polling place as a civic obligation, but fraught with moral duty. And un, un, under those circumstances, I get, I get left in a real pickle sometimes. Let me, let me back up with you for just a moment, if I may, please. Uh, yeah. and, and uh, ask you, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, you mentioned the fact that people are hollering that somehow the, there was a failure of regulation in this. Aren't the same people who are who are squealing that, Ed, the same people who have said that regulations kill jobs? Uh, do they want to have their cake and eat it too? Yeah, they can't have it both ways. I mean, let's face it, uh, you know, what they want is deregulation. What they want is to do away with the EPA. What they want is to uh, once again go back to you know a freewheeling time when uh, people uh, died in the mines and uh, died in the spills like this, died at uh, Buffalo Creek. What they want uh, are those, those what they think were the good old days. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when something like this happens, uh, some suddenly somehow it's the government's fault that it didn't carry out its responsibilities in uh, regulation. Well, it, it's illogical. That's irrational, isn't it? It certainly is. And among among the things that we have learned, uh, the according to uh, Ken Ward Jr., who has done some really, really good work on the fly for the Charleston Gazette, uh, we learned that the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection has never even set foot on the property of the Orwellianly named Freedom Industries because Freedom Industries required no permit from the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. How in the how in the world does something you've got I mean, this place sits a mile and a half upstream from the intake for three hundred uh, for clean drinking water for three hundred thousand people, and there's no requirement that they be inspected. There's no permitting requirement. How does something like that happen, Ed? I don't know. Uh, you know they have these huge tanks containing harmful chemicals they're built on the very edge of the waterways that we depend on for drinking water taking baths and putting out fires and and what has brought us to this point where a hole in the bottom of a chemical tank undetected due to dereliction by a company cleaning coal can shut down our major population centers close our schools terrify our residents and threaten to send people to the hospital i mean is what on earth are we thinking? What are we doing here? Especially, uh, you know, when we have uh, pledged to the people of West Virginia that we will protect them and their lives, and then uh, something like this happens, and and uh, once again we see that there's uh, there are huge problems not only uh, you know within the private sector but within government as well. Well, one of the things that I think needs to be drawn out as well, Ed, is the fact that. This substance was used to wash coal. That right. means that it was that means that it was trucked, I presume, trucked from these sites to coal preparation plants all over, uh, probably southern West Virginia. I don't know if there's another company storing this, selling this stuff uh, in northern West Virginia, but it was trucked all over southern West Virginia to coal preparation plants, and that means that this toxic stuff has been used in proximity to homes and communities. Uh, God only knows where, but the process doesn't even stop there because anybody who takes a good look at, say, Google Earth and zooms in on southern West Virginia will notice that we've got a lot of lakes in southern West Virginia or what appear to be lakes, but they're actually multi-billion gallon toxic waste dumps of the waste water liquid refuse toxins from those coal cleaning processes and the water that comes off of mountaintop removal sites and generally. So this this isn't. Uh, can you speak to the fact that that 
uh, or can you speak to the process whereby so many West Virginians are kept in the dark until something disastrous like this takes place? Well, there's almost like putting blinders on. You know, there's this whole business about um, why we should revere this patrimony. Now, we should worry about our patrimony. After all, uh, you know, these outside coal companies have been coming in here to West Virginia and stealing our patrimony for years. They do pay severance tax, but it's but it certainly is not enough. And it certainly is not going to make up for all the debt all of the people who have been hurt, all of the coal miners with the black lung disease. You know, back in 1948, Bob, uh, 126,000 miners were employed in in the uh, coal mining industry. Uh, This was long before the Environmental Protection Agency was ever even invented. Since that time, there's been a decline in the number of uh, coal miners required to mine the coal. In 1980, there were 100,000. Uh, since that time, even more decline. And now, uh, you know, that was before the uh, Clean Air Act was even enacted. And now today, there are fewer than 25,000 coal miners, and that's largely in part, uh, largely because uh, what we do now is lop off the tops of mountains. It's easier to get at the coal. Mechanization, really, and modernization of the, of the uh, coal mining has caused that. So, it's not, is it really worth our while to perpetuate this industry when uh, we know what it does to us, we know what, uh, what has happened, and we know that Walmart is the biggest employer, private employer in, this, in the state of West Virginia, not coal. Walmart is the biggest private employer. So we can do better than that. And the, the people of West Virginia, I think, uh, subconsciously understand this. And now I think these, uh, this is a wake-up call. How many more wake-up calls do we need? I, 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 don't, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that, Ed, uh, and I hope, I hope my own pessimism proves to be quite wrong on the subject. What can be done uh, from a congressional standpoint to bring some sort of relief to people who are uh, poisoned and sickened and killed for profit in this state? Well, all kinds of things can be done. You know, uh, the federal government uh, is launching a criminal investigation into what has happened uh, in the Kanawha Valley. Uh, so that is one thing that is underway. Um, President Obama has uh, uh, ordered uh, that there, there be relief uh, brought to our state, even though uh, there's almost palpable hatred of the president, in this, certainly in the southern coal fields, because... Uh, people have been misled uh, about this so-called war on coal. And, you know, the thing that is is uh, really uh, rather unfortunate is that uh, so many politicians here pander to the hatred, pander to those who would, uh, who uh, you know, who are saying that there's a war on coal and that, they, and that Obama is responsible for it, uh, when in fact... Uh, in this state, the federal government provides uh, about 27% of the personal income that, uh, that people receive here. That's more than in the, uh, any other state in, in the union. And uh, I think uh, that uh, obviously uh, people discount uh, how important the federal government has been in uh, their lives in terms of uh, uh, disability in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, benefits from the, the uh, black mm. and black lung disease in terms of uh, food stamps in terms of veterans uh, benefits in terms of social security all of these things come as a result of uh, action by the federal government so uh, obviously we always turn to the federal government uh, in times of stress and times of the uh, of the uh, of what's happening to us right now so uh, it, it, there's a, a kind of uh, uh, psychosis that goes on here, Bob, when you have folks who, uh, on the one hand, uh, attack and blast the federal government, and at the same time receive so many benefits from from the government. Let me let me ask you this: You and I have talked, um, uh, well, we've corresponded back and forth 
uh, about the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency Act, uh, right. presently in Congress as H.R. 526. Uh, it provides, among other things, I, I think it's kind of a beacon insofar as it says that what's important is the health and well-being of the citizenry and that, we, and that informed citizens deserve to know what it is that's being used around them and whether or not it causes cancer, birth defects, heart disease. And it mandates, it mandates a fully funded federal study. Is that the kind of thing that, that this state is in need of, uh, perhaps even where... Uh, where ke where chemicals like uh, this this mouthful that got dumped into the water uh, are concerned, do do people deserve to know what is in their world around them? Well, of course they do, and uh, uh, you know uh, it's but it's not in the interest of uh, those who make uh, a lot of money from uh, from the industry to uh, inform the people and to educate them. Uh, we need to do more educating, obviously. And uh, the very kind of thing that you're suggesting here with, uh, with regard to that act uh, is the kind of thing that we need to inform the people about so uh, they can make good choices uh, on their own about uh, what their futures might, uh, what the future might hold for them. Do you have any idea, uh, uh, have you heard anything and anybody you're talking to, uh, what the economic impact of this is going to be? We've talked about uh, the relatively small amount of economic impact that the coal industry now has in West Virginia. But when you talk, when you consider that everybody who has a health permit from, say, the Kanawha County Health Department to serve food, serve beverages, uh, take care of children, hospitals, schools, universities, every one of these things is shut down right now. That's right. What's what? It, I mean, yeah. what's it like in Charleston right now? I mean, I'm, I'm up on the mountain in Fayette County. I don't know. Well, it's awful. I went there uh, today. I live in Lincoln County, which is one of the counties that is affected by uh, this. Uh, all the schools are shut down. Uh, all of the businesses, uh, all the grocery stores, all of the um, restaurants are all shut down. Uh, the same thing in Charleston. Uh, people are uh, have uh, you know there have been tales of people fighting over uh, uh, when, uh, trying to get bottled water. Um, uh, people have had to uh, go to water uh, provisioning stations in order to get uh, uh, water to drink. They can't take showers. They can't bathe. They can't uh, use uh, the, the and in the it's the odor is horrendous. I was there uh, in, in South Charleston today. Uh, and it, and it burns your eyes. Uh, it affects uh, your breathing. It, it's st and you can still notice it. It's still yeah, present. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was surprised. I thought it would have dissipated by this time, but it has. That's that's and amazing. The, yeah, there are lots of uh, lawsuits that are coming. By the way, I mean uh, those people who have lost income as a result of this, uh, they're going to be filing lawsuits. Uh, and there's no telling uh, where this is going to end. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, one of the problems is people, are, the officials are unclear when it's going to be over. Apparently, it's going to take uh, literally months to clean out uh, pipes through which this uh, this chemical ran and fouled the pipes, uh, the systems. And it's going to take an awful long time to uh, to get. The, so nobody really knows exactly when this uh, disaster is going to come to an end. And that's. And that's left people high and dry. They don't know when they can go back to work. They don't know when they're, they're going to open schools again. They don't know any of this, and and that's really frustrating. Obviously, do you have any do you have any comments, Ed, on the uh, quality of leadership that has been forthcoming from West Virginia's political elite on this uh, on, on on this issue? My concern is this: that both the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party. You know, I have railed obviously in the past about how we need to return to our roots, to the days of JFK and the days of LBJ and the uh, the days of when the Democratic Party really stood for uh, with the people and for the people. I remember when Jack Kennedy, for example, uh, stood uh, uh, on the State House steps in Charleston, West Virginia, uh, on the 100th uh, birthday, and it was pouring rain, and there were thousands and thousands of people there to listen to him speak uh, because they loved him 
After all, in West Virginia, they voted for uh, Jack Kennedy in that primary election against Hubert Humphrey back in 1960. I know that's a long time ago for people, uh, and they don't remember this, but he won, Jack Kennedy won in the state of West Virginia in that primary, and that propelled him into the national limelight as a candidate who could win despite the fact that he was a Catholic, winning here in this uh, rather fundamentalist uh, state of West Virginia. So he was there on the 100th anniversary, and the, and the rain was coming down, and and, uh, and and the people were there uh, applauding him. And he his opening line was, the sun does not always shine in West Virginia, but the people always do. And they uh, loved him for that. And now where are we? We are at a time when uh, a, um, a Democratic president, Barack Obama, is uh, is there, and the people hate him. Uh, we're here at a time when... Uh, 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 chemical companies can uh, foul our streams, and uh, a lot of people aren't even up in arms. Uh, formerly, uh, Democratic politicians, politicians of the Democratic Party, uh, would have been doing something, would have been uh, railing against this. I don't hear that. And what I hear, though, is uh, the same old song from uh, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the Democratic Party, I call the, these these folks in the hierarchy, not the uh, good Democrats on the ground, but in the hierarchy, uh, crypto Republicans, because they have basically morphed into uh, into the Republican Party. So it's a singular party, and the things I am saying are the things that the uh, people in the Democratic Party ought to be saying today, uh, but they aren't. They, they're, you know, they. The state has gone more red than ever before. It's like a red state. It's, it's, uh, and, and the conservatism is, uh, is appalling in terms of, of uh, not serving the people, but serving the industry. You know, that's what I said before. That when uh, the Shelley Moore Capitos of the world talk about coal, that what they're really talking about is, is uh, sustaining the coal industry and not helping the miners and the people in the community. That's where we are. Well, you know, of course, uh, Shelley Moore Capito, uh, with no sense of irony whatsoever, was tweet was Facebooking about job killing regulations at the same time that the poison was being released into the river. I trust you know that, don't you? I do know that. That's yes, indeed. And of course, uh, the other thing that I also pointed this out: the other the, the West Virginia Coal Association today tweeted, "If it's good enough to wash coal, it's good enough to wash me." Uh, did they really do that? I, I didn't see that tweet. Uh, yeah, they really, they really, really did. With a smiley face. Oh no. Uh, this is, and but this, uh, for for someone like me who has followed this for a number of years, Ed, this is par for the course. I remember when the birth defects study was released, and the National Mining Association responded with a press release saying that the study was invalid because hillbillies can't help uh, committing incest. Oh, I remember that. I saw it. Uh, at, at, there's a there's a level of dis. Uh, I think I think we're being taken for granted, Ed, uh, there, because the disdain that the, these these industries have and their uh, and their their political purchases have uh, for the well being the well being of workaday West Virginians is almost inexpressible. Uh, that's why I found it so diff so so I don't know dissonant. I guess when I saw that uh, Earl Ray Tomlin the governor of this state, uh, when I saw that his signature statement on this disaster, and it is a disaster, uh, was to say that uh, it was unacceptable for this to have happened. I, I, I certainly hope the CEO of Freedom Industries knows it's unacceptable. <laughs> well, it's a travesty, and it's a shame. You know, uh, Bob, uh, people are fed up, though, I think. Uh, with what they see going on in uh, in our state and in, also in in Washington, I, I do believe, and that's one of the things, reasons I have hope that there are. For, for example, uh, last year, uh, voter turnout in West Virginia was the worst in the nation. Less than fifty percent of the people turned out to, to vote. Among young people, less than twenty three percent of the people turned out. And I think that there are an awful lot of people who, there who are frustrated just as you are uh, uh, so well tonight are, are saying and, and uh, exhibiting, I think they're frustrated and, and they want something new and, and uh, that's what I, I'm trying to offer them. I, and I'm not being arrogant in this, but 
You know, they're frustrated with Washington's inability to function, and by the consequences of that failure right here in, in West Virginia, few jobs, low pay, not a lot of reason to think it's uh, going to get any better anytime soon. They're also exhausted by the, the perpetual party warfare that seems uh, to be not so much about what's good for America as it is about gaining political advantage at any price, and that's why folks are looking uh, for new and independent voices, I think, unburdened by the baggage of party politics and, and willing to work with others toward the solutions. And so, um, you know, uh, here in West Virginia, those those issues are magnified, and, and uh, I can go on and on, obviously, but, but uh, we're trying to do something about it. And I, I applaud you for it. I've been following you on Facebook for quite some time, and you always you always have things to say that that resonate very strongly with me. Um, let me. Uh, it would be unfair, I think, if I if I did not make mention of the fact that uh, political campaigns are not run on good intentions. Uh, they do require money. Uh, do you have a site set up where people uh, can help you out uh, if they wish to? Uh, well, I do. Yeah, thanks, Bob, for mentioning that. I really appreciate it. Uh, my website is under construction right now, but I am listed under Facebook, uh, Ed Rabel for Congress. You can go there and you can uh, donate, uh, contribute to, by using play, uh, PayPal, or you can send me a check at uh, Ed Rabel for Congress at Post Office Box 11574 in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, I think it's 23, I'll have to look it up. 25301? No, uh, 25339. Uh, uh, okay, five, different post office. Yeah. I, I remember when it was just 25301. That tells you, tells you how long I've been gone out of Charleston. <laughs> um, uh, let, me, let me also point out to people that you have a, uh, a, a book out there of your experiences um, prior to becoming uh, a, a political candidate in West Virginia. Uh, could you tell people a little bit about that, too? Well, um uh, I've been off the air since 1998. You know, I was a network television news correspondent for CBS and NBC uh, beginning back in 1966. But And I was on the air for about 40 years and all over the world and, and all over the United States covering uh, all the wars that we can remember, including Vietnam, for more than a year and uh, also uh, the wars in Central, the guerrilla wars in Central America. And... Um, uh, the Middle East Wars, the First and Second Gulf Wars. So I've been around the world, but I began right here. My roots are deep here in, in West Virginia. I was born in Charleston. I was raised uh, here. I went to St. Albans High School and, and uh, you know, was a, uh, graduated from St. Albans High, went to Morris Harvey College, which is now the University of Charleston, was graduated with a political science and history degree from there. And so I love uh, my state. Uh, I live not far from Rabel Mountain. You know, I have a, a, a mountain named after me. I didn't know you had a mountain, Ed. <laughs> my grandfather and great uncles uh, grew up on that mountain, and I used to go out there and uh, visit. I still go out to Rabel Mountain all the time to to uh, because there's still some Rabels living out there. And so uh, I love the state. I love the people. Uh, I don't dis coal because I know how important it has been to our uh, region, but I think it's time now to think about a post-coal uh, economy because if we don't, you know, we're going to wake up one of these days and coal will be gone and uh, all we'll be left with is the residue. So I talk about that in my book. It's called Ed Rabel Reports, Lies, Wars, and Other Misadventures. And uh, uh, I talk about my uh, beginnings here and about uh, leaving the state and going out. I had really a very fortunate opportunity to go to work for CBS News and then NBC. And uh, some folks may uh, remember uh, me from the, that time. But I decided to come back home to West Virginia to see, uh, to reconnect with my roots and to try to see, look around and see uh, whether there was an opportunity for me to pay back because I think that's important uh, for people uh, to do. The, the, you know, I think it's important for people to, to try to serve, and that's it. Uh, not to sound fatuous here, I don't mean to do that, but I do I did look around and I, I saw that not much had changed, quite frankly, in the time that, uh, from the time I'd left almost half a century ago, and I wondered about that. I wondered why it was. And I think, uh, in part, 
It has to do with uh, how we are so beholden to that industry which um, has uh, meant so much for us in the past, uh, but at the same time has uh, has been a, an albatross around our neck in many ways. And so what I am about is not uh, to, to destroy West Virginia, on the contrary, or to destroy its patrimony. What I'm about is that the people ought now uh, look uh, to make their economy more robust uh, to, uh, so that there will be more jobs here, so that people will want to come here and invest, so that we are no longer undereducated as we are today. And so we might be able to, uh, to uh, not lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but guarantee that those benefits that are coming to us uh, right now and look to the future so that the, uh, in the future the best and the brightest don't leave. You know, that's what happened. I left the state uh, um, thousands and thousands. Since 1950, we've lost 40% of our population, 40%. And... Uh, the reason for that is that the people who have the money to send their kids off to college, for example, out of the state, and they send them off and they say, you know, to them, don't ever come back here because there's no opportunity for you here. Well, I want to be able to see a state in which there are, there are opportunities, where people can remain here, where people can rear their families in a clean, safe environment. That's what I would like to see, Bob. Well, I understand that completely, uh, very, very well, Ed, because once one uh, w mm -hmm. something funny happens when people, when West Virginians leave West Virginia, no matter where they can go, as you can attest, wh whatever far-flung corner of the globe it may be, uh, West Virginians pine for home. They do, right? And they should. In 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 my case, it was a matter of I'm the only one in my family who was actually not born in West Virginia. And the West Virginia pining was so profound that I came back here. Uh, we visited a lot, but I came here because I wanted to, I wanted to experience what it was that so, uh, uh, so motivated and 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 so filled my own family uh, with love and adoration. And I had I had a good bit of that, but then I found out about mountaintop removal, and a lot changes when when that light goes on. You get a little bit more. Uh, ferocious about things, I suppose, because uh, for all the for all the times that I've been told uh, that a tree hugger like me should go back where I came from, all I can do is say, for instance, in regard, I saw a Facebook post today uh, from someone saying coal is our heritage, and I was on the keyboard before I knew what happened, Ed, because I said no, coal's not my heritage. Uh, my people have been in this state since before the first lump of coal was ever scraped out of a hillside. Our heritage in West Virginia is one of independence. Our heritage in West Virginia is one of self-determination. Our heritage in West Virginia is one of grit and courage. And all of, all of those things were here long before the first coal company came and, and, did, a, and, and, and did, a, uh, did an Appalachian person out of his land by, by virtue of the broad form deed. That's the West Virginia that I see uh, you know, fighting for. My grandfather, my great-grandfather uncles, uh, were, my father, were all in the mines. But that, but they did not self-define by virtue of their status as miners. They self-defined by virtue of their history and sense of place here. And, and to a certain extent, I think that really does make West Virginia uh, unique because there's so much movement out in, in, in many other states. But honest to Pete, I have, I've met West Virginians all over this country and they say, well, do you know where Culloden is? And I go, oh, heck yeah. And they say, that's where my family's from, and gosh, we love to go back whenever we can. So I thank you, Ed Rabel, uh, for your willingness to stand up for this state, the people of this state, and the future of this state. And I wish you the very best, and I hope this is only the first of many conversations that we will have as you proceed in, in your candidacy. Well, I welcome that. Thank you so much, Bob, and thanks for the good work that you're doing on the air here. I do appreciate that. And I know West Virginians who listen to you and others outside the state appreciate it as well. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you, Ed, and best of luck. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Second Congressional District candidate for Congress, Ed Rabel. Uh, Ed Rabel for Congress is where you'll find him on Facebook. Uh, 
I I have deep deep respect uh, for what for what Ed is trying to accomplish. And frankly, uh, when it when it came time when it, when I realized that I wanted to talk to someone about what was happening in the Kanawha Valley with this poisoning of the water supply, you know, for profit. Remember, it was done for profit. I realized that there would be none better than Ed Rabel, R-A-B-E-L, Ed Rabel, uh, to talk to. Uh, 